Welcome to this new video guide, specially designed to help you identify the birds in your garden. Our gardens cover an area far greater than all our nature reserves put together, so places like this are especially important to our wild birds. This small garden, less than four miles from London Hyde Park corner, has been visited by 30 different species of birds, well over half those shown in this video. To make identification easier, we've not arranged them in strict scientific order, but in groups that seem to make visual sense from comparison. For example, blackbird-sized birds are all grouped together, and so are those that you're likely to see flying at speed around the house. Well, what do we have to look out for in identifying all these species? In some instances, a bird can be instantly recognised from just one feature. In others, you may have to rely on several. The best yardstick is probably the sparrow, which we all know. But other common birds, such as the blackbird and pigeon, provide useful comparisons as well. You should also notice what shape the bird has. Is it plump? Or is it of slender appearance? Does it have rounded wings? Or pointed wings? Some birds have square-ended tails and some are notched. Others have very short tails and some are deeply forked. Look out for distinctive markings on the head. Or obvious patterns on the wing. Sometimes a bird may have a distinctive white rump. Another thing to notice is how a bird moves. Does it hop? Does it walk or run along the ground? Some birds feed mainly amongst the branches, while others usually feed only on tree trunks. Some feed continuously in the air, while others take off from perches to catch insects. It's also worth looking at tail postures. They could be cocked or flicking. Song can be a helpful feature, enabling you to identify a bird even without actually seeing it. It can also help you to tell apart two similar looking birds, such as this one, from this. And finally, the season in which you see the birds. Some are visitors which only come for the summer, mainly from Africa. Others fly in for the winter from Scandinavia. And many birds are in residence all the year. We've arranged this video in two main seasonal parts and we will begin with the birds that you're likely to see in the spring and summer months. 
but right at the end there's a quick reference section in which you can see all the species again. Robins are probably the tamest of all the birds in our gardens. They're always on the lookout for worms and other food which gardeners disturb. So if you persevere and keep still enough, you too could do this, using small earthworms or mealworms as bait. You can hear the robin's song in most months of the year. Robins will even sing after dark by lamplight. And neighbouring robins may be heard having song duels. They're rather aggressive birds, and if showing off the red breast doesn't discourage a potential intruder, a fight may ensue. The nest is usually built on a foundation of dead leaves, and may be on the ground, or in ivy on a wall or bank, or in a tree hole, even in an old can. Or inside a garden shed. Juveniles, unlike their parents, do not have red breasts. They're marked with brown. At this age, they are particularly vulnerable to cats. Robins have a scolding call. It's heard in many situations throughout the year. Robins become more secretive as they molt. But by September, they're busy staking out their winter territories again. The dunnock feeds on the ground, usually close to cover. It moves with short, jerky hops, flicking wings and tail a lot. Males, females and juveniles all look much alike. This is a female house sparrow. Compared with her, or a juvenile house sparrow, a dunnock has a darker appearance, greyish throat and breast, and a slender bill. The dunnock's song is a high-pitched warbling. The nest is usually in a bush or hedge. Dunnocks, or hedge sparrows as they were once commonly known, are often parasitized by cuckoos, and even in urban areas you may come across this unusual sight. Hedge sparrow foster parents trying to satisfy the apparently insatiable appetite of a young cuckoo. The wren has almost mouse-like behaviour as it creeps about the nooks and crannies of walls and tree stumps searching for tiny insects and spiders. It's easily recognised by its dumpy build and short tail which is usually cocked. Its slender bill is rather long in proportion to its body. It sings in most months of the year with a distinctive trill.
The nest is domed and often built on an ivy-covered stump or wall. The wren's alarm call is also heard frequently, including when fledglings are around. The young make piping noises. The goldcrest is our smallest bird, measuring just three and a half inches in length. You may catch sight of it in the branches of conifers, which it prefers. A favourite place for the suspended nest is in a yew tree. Gold crests have distinctive orange-yellow crowns, their gold crest, and white bars on the wings. Juvenile gold crests, however, do not have golden crowns. The willow warbler arrives from the south in April and may be seen throughout the summer flitting about broadleaf trees and bushes. That behaviour is rather like a gold crest's, but the willow warbler is a slim, graceful, greenish brown bird with a pale eye stripe, and it doesn't have the gold crest's distinctive crown. Only in larger gardens are you likely to hear the song of willow warblers and their call note. The chiff-chaff is very similar to the willow warbler and you really need to be quite expert to tell the two species apart by sight alone. However, chiff-chaffs usually arrive in late March before willow warblers and they tend to favour more mature trees. If you observe them closely, chiff-chaffs can be seen to have dark brown legs while willow warblers have light brown legs. But by far the easiest way to distinguish between the two warblers is by listening to their song. The chiff-chaff has a very recognisable repetitive phrase. While here again is the willow warbler's song for comparison. The black cap is another warbler which visits some larger gardens, usually from April onwards, although a few birds spend the winter with us. Overall, the plumage is greyer than that of the chiff-chaff and the willow warbler, but the crowns of both male and female are distinctively coloured. The male has a black cap, while the female has a chestnut-brown cap. You may hear a scolding call and a song which usually comes in short bursts and is particularly melodious. The spotted flycatcher is a summer resident that doesn't return to Britain much before the beginning of May. It lacks any really distinctive plumage, just mouse grey upper parts and a streaked breast. It's their behaviour which helps to identify them quickly, for unlike warblers, they use prominent perches from which to make darting sallies to catch insects. These are slow motion studies and sometimes you can actually hear the bill snapping as a flycatcher takes its prey. They often nest on buildings amongst creepers or in a suitable open nest box. The song is rather undistinguished and squeaky.
The pied wagtail is another bird which makes darting aerial sallies for its insect food. The female has a grey back and the male has a black back. It spends much of its time running over lawns, drives and roofs. The long slender tail is constantly wagging, as its name suggests. That tail and the black, grey and white plumage make this an easy bird to identify. Juveniles are less boldly marked. The blue tit is one of the most acrobatic of our garden visitors, usually feeding amongst the broad-leaved trees. It comes readily to bird tables. And it's frequently responsible for the holes in your milk bottle tops. Look out for its stubby bill, face pattern and yellow underparts. It has many different call notes. Listen also for that song which has a distinctive trill on the end. If you've put up nest boxes, then blue tits will be likely occupants. Later on, you may see the juveniles. They have less striking head patterns and yellowish faces. The great tit is larger than the blue tit. That glossy dark head and neck and the stripe down its yellowish belly are unmistakable. The breast stripe will enable you to tell the sexes apart. This is a male, and this a female with a narrower breast stripe. Great tits also have many different calls and a distinctive but quite variable song. Like blue tits, they're adept at opening milk bottles. The coal tit is smaller than both the great tit and the blue tit, and can often be seen feeding in conifers, although not exclusively. It has a rather sweeter song than the great tit. By comparing the coal tit with the great tit, we can also see that the coal has no black stripe down its breast, and it has a different head pattern. In particular, the coal tit has a white patch at the back of the head. The long-tailed tit is a small, slender bird, but it has a very long tail. 
It also has a black stripe over the eye. These birds are early nesters and they make intricate nests of lichens, moss and spiders webs. Finally, the domed nest is lined with feathers. The juveniles have different face patterns and they also can be picked out by their shorter tails. House sparrows, for many of us perhaps the most familiar of the birds in our garden. Noisy, gregarious and bold, they make every possible convenience out of man, finding holes in our roofs for their nests. The male is really quite a handsome bird, with its grey crown, black throat and greyish white cheeks. Compare him with the drab female. Juveniles are rather similar to females, though more freshly coloured. Occasionally, the much more local tree sparrow may be seen amongst house sparrows, and it may be identified by means of its black cheek spot and chestnut head, which both males and females have. Tree sparrow and male house sparrow. The chaffinch is the commonest of the British finches, though not necessarily in gardens. It feeds mainly on the ground, but it will also search among the tree branches for caterpillars and other food. Chaffinches have easily recognised calls. And the male has a brief, accelerating song. He's colourful, with blue head and pink breast, compared with the drabber female. Chaffinches have white outer tail feathers and bold white wing bars. And this is useful in distinguishing the female chaffinch from the female house sparrow. The nest is very neat, of moss and roots lined with hair. It's usually placed in a dense bush or the fork or branch of a tree. Green finches are also common in both town and country gardens. The male is olive green with a distinctive yellow patch along the edge of its wings and the side of its tail. Notice also the much heavier bill, which indicates it's mainly a seed eater. The female is duller. Both sexes have a notched tail. The greenfinch's song can also be heard sometimes during flight. The goldfinch is the most colourful of all our finches but it really prefers gardens with fruit trees and where it can feed on the seeds of such plants as thistles and dandelions. With their scarlet red faces and black and white heads, they're quite unmistakable.
The juveniles only have streaky brown faces. But they too show yellow flashes on the wings in flight, clearly seen in these slow motion studies of adults. Their skill in teasing out the seeds from thistles and other plants is fascinating to watch. This goldfinch is taking up grit to help grind up the seeds in its gizzard. The bullfinch, a shy bird, is about the same size as a greenfinch, but it's plumper and has a distinctive black cap. The male's rosy red breast is also very recognisable. The female also has a black cap, but is less colourful, with pinkish-grey underparts. They have a soft piping call, and in flight, the white rump is conspicuous. Although that stout bill is meant mainly for seeds and berries, bullfinches do have an unfortunate habit of feeding on fruit buds in the spring. The red poll is a small, streaky brown finch, which can be easily overlooked, although the crimson forehead and black chin are quite distinctive in close-up. It has a trilling song. Like greenfinches, red poles have notched tails. And in common with several other finches, the red pole nests in June and July, much later than most garden birds. Juveniles lack the red markings of the adults, but may be distinguished from other finches by their black bibs. Linnets, another small species of finch. In full breeding plumage, a young male is easy to recognise with its crimson crown and breast. Other males may appear less colourful, but none have black chins, which immediately distinguishes them from red poles. The female has duller plumage. Later in the year, they may be seen in family parties, and in distinguishing them from red poles, it's useful to remember that linnets show pale wing patches and white outer tail feathers in flight, whereas red poles do not. The blackbird is a very common member of the thrush family and the adult male's black plumage make him easily recognisable. He has a bright orange-yellow bill and yellow eye ring. Note that the female is not black, but dull brown, with a paler throat. The blackbird has a beautiful flute-like song. Blackbirds also have a distinctive alarm call which is commonly used when going to roost. They feed mainly on the ground, hopping and running with pauses while searching for earthworms. or flicking aside leaves with the bill. The nest, in which four or five young are raised, is usually concealed in a hedge, a bush, or amongst climbers such as ivy.
The juveniles are also brown, rather paler than the female, and with mottled underparts. The song thrush is another common garden bird whose song will probably be familiar. It's made up of clear, repeated phrases. You may not always be able to see it well while it's singing, so here is the blackbird in song for comparison. The song thrush feeds in a similar fashion to the blackbird, short runs or hops followed by a pause. In dry weather, they feed on snails, smashing the shells on a stone, the anvil. The nest is rather like a blackbird's, usually in a hedge or a bush, but unlike the blackbird's, it's lined with mud. The missile thrush is larger than the song thrush, with greyer upper parts and white tips to the outer tail feathers. Its posture is more upright than the song thrush, too and it has more boldly spotted underparts. Here are the two together for comparison. The song may be heard as early as February and consists of short, flute-like phrases, more like a blackbird's than a song thrush's, but quite strident. You often hear their distinctive rasping call, too. Missile thrushes nest early, usually quite high in the fork of a tree. Juveniles are pale, with head and back spotted with white. Starlings are bustling, gregarious birds, often jostling other birds for space at the bird table. Although quite dark, they can easily be distinguished from blackbirds by their shape and plumage. They're plumper, have shorter tails, and some speckles on their glossier plumage. The starling's song is a mixture of warbling, clicking, and whistling. And, as they're good mimics, they'll often include snatches of other bird calls. Unlike blackbirds, they don't hop and run, but move in a jerky walk, jabbing at insects, earthworms, or anything they can find. They nest in holes in buildings and in trees. The juveniles are mouse brown in color with a pale throat. This one is just changing into its adult plumage. Swallows usually arrive from Africa during April. The sexes are alike and have distinctive chestnut red foreheads and throats and long tail streamers. These are slow motion studies. When feeding, they fly lower than martins and swifts.
They nest on rafters, in doors, perhaps an old garden shed or stable in which the door is always open. After they leave the nest, you can recognize the juveniles by their short tail streamers. Here is an adult and a juvenile for comparison. During August, large parties of swallows assemble before their migration back to Africa. House martins are related to swallows and also come from Africa for the summer months. Their blue-black upper parts contrast with pure white underparts. And the white rump shows up well at certain angles. House martins tend to fly higher than swallows, but even at a distance, you should be able to see that the martins do not have the long tail streamers, which are so distinctive of adult swallows. You can sometimes see the house martins gathering mud from a puddle to build their nests under the eaves of houses. They can breed right up to September. In a good year, a pair will raise three broods. Like swallows, they gather in pre-migration assemblies at the end of summer, often sunbathing on the roofs of houses. Of the three kinds of birds that you will see flying at speed over the housetops, the swift is the latest to arrive and the earliest to depart. It's not usually seen until the last few days of April at the earliest and is gone by mid-August. In fine weather, it's the highest flyer of all the aerial feeders, but even at a distance, its scythe-like wings and short forked tail should help you to identify it. Swifts also have a distinctive screaming call. They nest in holes under roofs of buildings. In fact, it's the only time that these birds ever land. So you will never see them assemble on wires or roofs before migration as you do with swallows and house martins. Apart from that difference, the three, swifts, house martins and swallows, can be readily distinguished by their flight silhouettes. Here's the swift, uniform sooty brown plumage, next to a house martin and a swallow with long tail streamers. A number of birds visiting our gardens specialize in searching for food on the trunks of trees. If you have mature trees, you may notice this rather mouse-like bird making its way up the trunks, searching for tiny insects. It's a tree creeper. It's so small you might just confuse it with a wren. But the tree creeper has white underparts, a slender, down-curved bill, and a stiff tail which it keeps pressed to the bark. The wren, on the other hand, is much dumpier and holds its tail in a different way. The high-pitched song of the tree creeper may be heard from February onwards. The nest is usually behind loose bark, often on a dead tree. The nuthatch is another bird that may be seen climbing about tree trunks and branches. It has a loud trill. Unlike the tree creeper, the tail is not used for support when moving about and feeding.
Although it's able to move in any direction, you very often see the nuthatch moving down trunks, while the tree creeper invariably moves upwards, often in a spiral. Nuthatches have strong woodpecker-like bills which they use for chiseling open nuts. They take over existing holes for their nests rather than excavate their own, reducing the size of the entrance with mud to suit their needs. Great spotted woodpeckers are usually only seen in well-wooded gardens. Although they will occasionally feed on the ground and visit bird tables, particularly in winter, they're mainly seen on tree trunks and boughs. They also use their strong bills to excavate a nest hole. With this species of woodpecker, you can easily distinguish male from female. The male has a crimson patch on his nape, while the female has not. you can see both attending their young here. First the male, and then the female. The juveniles can easily be recognized. They don't have the same head markings as their parents. Instead, they all have distinctive crimson crowns. In the green woodpecker, the sexes are similar. The laughing call, which can be heard from afar, is easily recognized. Its plumage is very different from that of the great spotted woodpecker. During its undulating flight, the yellowish-green rump shows up well. The nest is excavated from the bowl of a tree, a live oak or ash with heart rot, or the dead limb of a beech. After they leave the nest, you'll be able to see that the juvenile's greeny-brown upperparts carry pale spots, and their underparts are streaked. Green woodpeckers often feed on the ground, usually on ants, so they may be seen on lawns of larger gardens. This is an adult, and this is a juvenile. In fact, it's still being fed some of the time by one of the parents. The wood pigeon is the largest of this group of birds. It's rather heavily built with white neck patches. Wood pigeons make a noisy clatter of wings when they're disturbed. In flight, they show white wing bars running from front to rear and a broad black bar across the end of the tail. And their nest is a very rudimentary affair, a slender platform of twigs through which you can sometimes see the two eggs. The juveniles have no white on the neck. Feral pigeons are descendants of rock doves which nest on cliff ledges, so it's not surprising that feral pigeons choose mainly to nest on the ledges of buildings. 
And like wild rock doves, they often show a white rump and a double black wing bar. There's no white on the neck, but there's a wide variation in plumage, as you can see when several birds are together in a city center. The collared dove is smaller than wood or feral pigeons. Indeed, it's altogether a paler, slimmer looking bird than the others. It also has that narrow black half collar around the back of its neck. It often calls from a television aerial or chimney pot. And it frequently drinks at bird baths or garden ponds. In flight, it shows a relatively long tail with a black and white pattern underneath. And here again are the three birds in this group for comparison. The plump wood pigeon with its white neck collar. The feral pigeon with iridescent colors. And the collared dove, pale with a black half collar. The magpie is one of the easiest members of the crow family to recognize with its striking black and white plumage and long wedge-shaped tail. Notice the wing pattern in flight. The sexes are alike. Magpies and the harsh rattling calls they make have been increasingly in evidence in towns in recent years. They feed a lot on the ground, though they do take eggs and young of small birds, particularly when feeding their own young in May and June. They'll eat a wide variety of other foods, including insects, dead animals and scraps. They build a large domed nest in a thorn bush or tree, though in recent years some birds seem to be doing away with the dome. The juveniles are rather similar to the adults, but without such long tails. Jays are certainly the most colorful of the crow family. They tend to be rather shy, though they can sometimes be seen down on the lawn. You may hear their harsh call, and catch a glimpse of a bird in flight, showing a blue, white and black pattern and rounded wings. And because they will probably be flying away, you should notice a black tail and conspicuous white rump. In autumn, they are frequently seen around oak trees, gathering acorns. Carrion crows are uniformly black. They too have adapted to town life in some areas and so are seen in gardens from time to time. They have a deep hoarse call. The nest is a bulky affair made of sticks, although urban crows occasionally use strange materials. An adult rook is similar to a carrion crow, except that it has a longer, sharper bill, longer tail, and, most obvious of all, a bare, greyish-white face. Note that the carrion crow's bill is stouter and is fully feathered at the base. Rooks have a rather sedate manner of walking. They nest in groups, in trees, rookeries, and they have raucous calls. (laughs) 
After leaving the nest, the juveniles can easily be confused with carrion crows, as they have all black heads. But remember that rooks have longer, more pointed bills than crows. The jackdaw is smaller and more compact than the rook. Both species can sometimes be seen together in flocks. The jackdaw, however, has a grey nape, relatively short bill and pale eye. It flies with quicker wing beats than a rook, and its calls are higher pitched. Jackdaws will nest in holes in trees, old buildings, and even chimneys if the fires are not in. The kestrel is the bird of prey you're most likely to see in towns, particularly if your house is close to a bypass or a motorway. In flight, look out for the long pointed wings and the long slim tail. When it hovers, trying to spot small mammals, it spreads its tail. The male kestrel has spotted chestnut upper parts and grey head and tail. The female has barred upper parts, brown head and tail. Kestrels have a shrill call. They nest in holes in trees, but in towns they're more likely to choose a ledge high up on an office or industrial building, or a church. The sparrowhawk is another bird of prey that has begun to take up residence in some suburban areas in recent years. An increase probably due to a recovery from the pesticide-induced decline of the 50s and 60s for it was once more common in town gardens. It hunts in a different way to the kestrel, zigzagging over suburban gardens in search of small birds. Notice that it too has a long tail, but rounder wings, compared to the kestrel's pointed wings. The male has dark grey upper parts and reddish-brown barred underparts. The female is larger than the male and is dark brown with a clearly barred breast. The nest is usually high up in a mature tree and while the young are being raised, the male is very busy hunting blue tits, sparrows and other birds. Sometimes prey will be taken at a bird table. feathers in a regular place under the trees is a possible sign of sparrowhawks. They have regular plucking places where they dismember their prey. The tawny owl is a nocturnal bird of prey with mottled brown plumage. You're most likely to hear its calls at dusk, particularly as autumn approaches when the owls will start establishing their territories. They nest in tree holes or large nest boxes. After leaving the nest, the young remain stationed on branches, motionless. You may hear their calls on summer nights, too. Adults can sometimes be seen in daytime during the period that they're feeding their young. As some gardeners know to their cost, herons prey on fish. There's not much mistaking a heron. In flight, look out for a very large bird with slow wing beats and bent neck. Herons have a single harsh call. Only individual herons will visit small garden ponds, usually in early morning in summer and autumn. 
This is an adult, but it's mostly juveniles with grey heads, which are seen in this situation. During September and October, our summer visitors will depart, and we'll be expecting our winter visitors from Europe and Scandinavia. Many of them won't come into the garden until conditions get severe. But in addition to them, there are plenty of resident species that are here all the year round, and many of them will come to our bird tables. If your bird table stands close to bushes, which provide cover and a convenient approach route for the birds, and you can see it from the window, well then, you can have hours of comfortable bird watching. But once you start feeding birds in this way, it's important to continue it throughout the winter, when the birds need it most. Several birds in this category can be seen in the garden all year round. The robin, for example. The dunnock, the gold crest, and the wren. Black caps may also be seen in gardens during the winter months. But these birds probably are not the same individuals as those we may have noticed during the summer. These wintering birds apparently move over to us from Eastern and Northern Europe. Remember that the female has a reddish brown cap and the male has a black cap, hence its name. During autumn and winter, many birds have to change their diet. There are a few caterpillars and other invertebrates around, and although some tits are known to store insects, rather like squirrels store nuts, the great tits and blue tits will be searching for beech mast and other seeds. So now is the time that these birds will especially be glad to find nuts at the bird table. It's worth noting that during an average winter's day, a great tit will have to consume about one third of its body weight in order to survive. Blue tits will probably be the most frequent visitors to your bird table. Coal tits will also be glad of the food that you put out. And long-tailed tits will occasionally visit bird tables during winter. But in winter, you may also see another member of the tit family. The marsh tit has a glossy black crown and brown back. Look out for the white cheeks and small black chin. For comparison, remember that the coal tit has a particularly white patch at the back of its head. And finally, the not closely related black cap, with its larger, more slender bill, grey rather than white cheeks, and it has no black chin. In addition to the common house sparrow, many of the finches seen during the summer will also be visiting gardens during the winter. In fact, chaffinches may be more frequently seen in winter. This is a male. And this is a female.
Greenfinches are frequent visitors to the nut containers at bird tables. This is a male, and this is a female. Most goldfinches leave Britain for the winter, but if you have some weedy waste patches in your garden, you may attract some of the few that remain. If you're very lucky, a bullfinch may visit the bird table, but it's an irregular occurrence. They're more likely to pay attention to the buds of hawthorn, forsythia, and your fruit trees in early spring. There are, however, some finches which only visit gardens during the winter. The siskin is a small, dumpy finch with a stout bill, yellow wing bar, rump and sides, and a short, deeply notched tail. They're only seen in gardens during some winters, and although they're partial to older cones, they may be particularly attracted to peanuts in red plastic containers. The female is generally brown, streaked with black. But the male is yellow-green. There could be some confusion with green finches, but the siskin has a black cap and chin, while the green finch has no black markings on the head. Note that the siskin is smaller than the green finch. The brambling is another winter visitor, and it's rather similar to the chaffinch. Bramblings usually come into gardens only during harsh winters, when they may be seen in the company of other finches. The male brambling has attractive plumage with mottled brown head and an orange shoulder patch. Quite different from the male chaffinch. The female brambling is perhaps more difficult to distinguish. She has black mottling on the crown and back. Both sexes have a white rump, which can be seen during flight. Gangs of starlings are likely to be around all winter. And you will certainly see blackbirds. This is a male. And this is a female. Also song thrushes. Missile thrushes may also be seen, and they will start singing in February. In winter, they become very aggressive, defending holly trees and other berry-bearing shrubs against other thrushes. The field fair is a visitor from Scandinavia and most likely to appear in gardens during hard winters. Slightly smaller than a missile thrush, it has handsome markings, a grey head with a black mask and a golden brown throat and breast with bold spots. It also has a grey rump which contrasts with a black tail, particularly in flight. The bold markings of the field fair make it easy to distinguish from a missile thrush. It has a harsh call. The red wing is another winter visitor from the north, smaller and darker than the song thrush and with some attractive markings. Look out for the chestnut red flanks and the buffish white stripe over the eye. These features clearly distinguish the red wing from the song thrush.
Red wings feed mainly on berry-bearing shrubs in the autumn. But in hard times, they will get quite tame and be grateful for any scraps on the ground around the bird table. And, of course, apples. The nuthatch is resident all year and can be fairly readily attracted to bird tables. It's particularly partial to peanuts and sunflower seed. The great spotted woodpecker may also be tempted by peanuts to the bird table. This is a male with a crimson patch and this is a female. The tree creeper may put in a rare appearance at a bird table, but is more likely to stay on the trees. Tree creepers have developed the habit of roosting in cavities in the soft bark of the trunks of redwoods. During the winter, both wood pigeons and feral pigeons may be seen in our gardens. Collared doves, too, are around all year. And in winter, will be more often seen close to or even on bird tables. All the crow family are resident during the winter months, and so you may see a carrion crow, or rooks with their grey-white faces, as well as the smaller jackdaws with their grey napes and pale eyes. Magpies may visit the bird table frequently pirating food from other birds. And jays, usually rather timid, may be hungry enough in hard times to come so close that you can admire their attractive plumage. They tend to be early morning visitors. Kestrel may be seen hovering over hunting grounds at any time. Kestrels have also been known to hunt for small birds around bird tables. This is a male with grey head and chestnut underparts. And this is a female with brown head and barred underparts. It's worth remembering that kestrels have pointed wings, whereas sparrowhawks have rounded wings. Sparrowhawks may put in a brief and sudden appearance at a bird table in an attempt to catch a small bird. Tawny owls are often much in evidence in winter and can be heard defending their territories. An appearance at a bird table would be very rare.
But there's always the possibility of a heron flying in to raid the pond. This section enables you to review all the birds in the video quickly. The reference numbers refer to the order in which the birds first appeared in the main part of the video. We've repeated some of the most common songs and calls, and we've included a few extra species that are only occasionally seen in gardens.